Welcome to the Microgen DX Mic'd Up Podcast. Discover how cutting-edge next-generation sequencing technology is revolutionizing medical diagnosis, empowering healthcare professionals with rapid and accurate identification of microbes. Our experts take you through the science behind microbiome testing so that you can make better decisions when it comes to patient care. Plus, hear stories from patients firsthand about their journey toward better health. Let's get started. Good afternoon or evening or where, morning, wherever you may, time it might be with for you, but we like to welcome Dr. Carolyn Fife to talk about the use of microgen diagnostics in, in chronic wounds and how it's made a difference in her patient care. And, and hopefully uh, this will be uh, helpful to the audience and that uh, open your eyes to a, an, an opportunity to look at another way of diagnosing and, and identifying microbes in these chronic wounds. So thank you, Dr. Fife. Thanks for asking me. Although I always feel a little bit like an imposter because um, I feel like every time I get one of these reports, I'm I'm figuring it out from scratch with a, a few guidelines. You guys have wonderful resources, which I have to say how much I appreciate that if I have a question, I can always get hold of a live person and be connected to a infectious disease doc or another wound care doc. And you've even connected me to some folks who were looking for a little mentorship. And I don't know that that was really one of the things you wanted to talk about, but I just don't know any other company that provides a service like that. And so I thank you for, for going above and beyond sending me a report, but making sure that I have the help I need to understand it. It's unique. Well, that's nice to hear that. Yeah, we are always looking. People are calling and want to speak to a colleague in the wound care profession. So we appreciate you being a mentor to those individuals. Yeah, you bet. I, I want to have a shout out to all the nurse practitioners and the and the, the PAs out there too, because I've had some, thanks to you, really fabulous conversations with folks who are providing spectacular care in really isolated places and don't have a mentor. And um, I've enjoyed talking to those folks, even though I'm not sure I know more than they do. <laughs> but um, it has also made me aware of how badly we need to have connectedness uh, so we can help each other along with these tough cases. Yep, definitely. So there was a couple of uh, cases that you wanted to talk about specifically where um, the technology has has made a difference for you and or made a difference in your treatment decisions? Yeah, um, you know, I had so many cases we could have talked about. I don't know exactly what is the most useful, but I'll, um, I'm going to go under the assumption that most folks are like me and that they, they're not infectious disease docs. They have a pretty good general understanding of barriers to wound healing, and they've got a group of patients that you feel like you've done the stuff you were supposed to do and they're not getting better <laughs> or something changed. So um, I probably have 20 cases I could talk about, but if I was just going to pick two or three to talk about how it made a difference or didn't make a difference, or I think is equally important to discuss, um, you all probably remember that a few years ago, you saved the life of one of my transplant patients. We've told her story before. I'll recap it briefly just because um, it is so, um, it's such a great illustration of how this technology can make a difference. But, uh, you know, I'm in Houston. We got the Houston Medical Center. She's a transplant patient from one of the finest institutions in the land. Um, many comorbid conditions, a type one diabetic um, with you know, losing toes and having uh, on dialysis, having had a transplant that then failed and then another transplant. And um, she had been hospitalized twice for sepsis um, with, and even had her leg opened up with fasciotomies for what looked like a necrotizing infection and they found nothing. So she was sent to me for follow-up for these um, very large wounds, surgical wounds after her fasciotomies and um, we were able to use yeah, the um, microgen technology to identify the, 
the fact that um, she had a life-threatening fungal infection. And so she, <laughs> as soon as I realized what we were in mucor, uh, rhizopus is what she had. As soon as I realized what we were dealing with, you, you know, I'm, you call, you, you call me and then I'm, you know, she's not in the office that day. I'm calling everybody and, and her family and emergently getting her to the hospital and she survived. And so a year later, she came back again with sort of a cellulitis, um, some minor open areas with just a little bit of seepage from an edematous leg. So maybe one of the first points here is that I wasn't sure there was a point in doing another assay for somebody that just had edema with some blisters that were seeping. I really didn't know if it was going to give us anything, but um, we identified um, uh, two different fungal uh, problems, fun two different fungi, candida uh, subspecies, and one that I'm even afraid to say some of these names. I just pulled up the report, but um, Willemia sebi, I don't even know what that is which is another thing to discuss that, you know, so many times I get this list of bacteria and I have to Google to find out what the heck they are. But, uh, you know, this is a woman whose life had been threatened before who was already on long-term antifungals. So of course I called her transplant team and the ID folks, but that was clearly something that she was still colonized with and struggling with that explained these issues. So, um, You'd already saved her once, and now we could use it again to identify perhaps not a life-threatening problem, but the reason why she continued to have a little open sores. And the further surprise for me that it was possible to get useful data from just a little juice, I guess, is the best way to yeah. put that. So I've never really asked you what your guidelines or your thoughts are about taking the samples, you know, if you have a big gaping hole, you know, you can stick the little Q-tip down in there, or take a little piece of tissue and put it in the transport media. But I've never really asked whether there were, you know, I assume we have to have some kind of fluid, some kind of tissue. We don't want to just wipe the Q-tip along the skin somewhere. And um, I guess now's a good time for you to educate me if there are uh, guidelines or things that are going to be pointless or a waste of time. Feel free to tell me now in front of everyone. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Sampling is sampling technique is obviously critical. Um, it's going to infect, uh, in, impact the yield that we have on our test. And so um, we, we teach physicians to the best sample for a wound is going to be with a fifteen blade or a curette and do a light scraping of the wounds of the complete wound surface. Um, and if it's and necrotic tissue, if like, if it's is that not bad? Conducive to. I, I just talked over you. I'm sorry. If, but it's, like... if it's necrotic tissue, you, you know, yeah, that's a, if there's a lot of dead, non viable material in there, then we'll get an, a, a negative. Um, uh, but so, what I teach physicians is if you want to go right on the margin, the same with a bone sample for osteomyelitis, if you take the sample right where the most destruction is. Um, you're going to get a lot of dead non viable material. If you go right to the margin where they, you have diseased bone and healthy bone, you'll get a good yield in the sample. But on the on the on a tunneling wound like that, you could either do a if you can get into a scraping, um, great. If you can't, then you know swab technique is is fine uh, as long as you really you know roll that swab and get as much material on the swab as possible. <clears throat> Sometimes with fluid. Um, if it's a, only a little bit of fluid, swab is the best technique because, you know, during transport, if, it, if it's a little fluid and it's in a sterile cup, it might evaporate. So, but yeah. by putting it in the swab tip, you're going to be able to, we're going to be able to extract it from the swab tip. So, um, so best sample is always tissue scraping. If it's not conducive to that because it's on the ankle and it's a painful area where you don't want to take a blade or a curette, then take a swab and just is as hard as you can rub the swab. It, I just had a case yesterday, I talked to a wound care provider and she had a really low yield on a sample. And she said, Rick, I don't, there was a lot of exudate on the dressing. And she said the wound was really dry when she tried to take a swab. And I said, well, if it's a really dry wound, you should take some sterile saline and put the swab in sterile saline, moisten the swab because a moistened swab pick up more microbial DNA in a dry wound. But you don't um, want to get any fluid 
from the dressing itself. Like that's not going to be useful, right. I assume. Yeah, right. yeah, I've never tried that, but I thought, hey, I might as well display my ignorance in front of the whole world. Um, <laughs> although they probably probably already know. Um, and you know, another, <laughs> it's when the results come back. There have been times that nurses and I would laugh and say, if we say all these out loud, are we going to turn into a toad? You know, it's always embarrassing when you are uh, seeing these bacteria for the first time. Uh, I don't think it's one of the cases we plan to talk about, but I've posted the case on my on my blog some time ago. Uh, I, I I I I love dogs, but I don't like seeing dog hair in dressings. And I have uh, gotten good enough; I can almost identify what kind of dog the patient has based on the hair that's in the dressing and often on the wound. And and it's uh, so it makes me laugh because as soon as I'll say there's an awful lot of dog hair in this, the the, the patients always come to the defense of their dog. Why it's not the dog's fault? It's like I that was really I was not criticizing your dog. I'm just we need a cleaner situation here. And one thing I remember so well, this young woman, another type one diabetic who's a transplant survivor with a diabetic foot ulcer that she'd been neglecting, neuropathic, of course, and dog hair in the wound. And sure enough, your microgen assay came back with four or five different canine bacteria. And so, you know, it's trying to make the point to her that I don't know whether that's the reason you're not healing, but I just can't believe with you on transplant drugs that, you know, anything that starts anaerococcus is probably not something you want in your wound. I'm just, I'm not an ID doc, but I don't think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I probably don't want things that have the word vaginalis or, you know, sort of those words. I don't think you have to be an ID doc to say it probably shouldn't be in your foot. Uh, but I just almost had to laugh yeah. that you don't always see um, animal bacteria, but it makes sense that you might. I don't know how, I guess that raises the point that it's not just the bacteria, it's the host too, right? So one of the reasons I tend to um, to use this is, is in the patients that are immunocompromised. Oh, and we have lots of those. About 8% overall of wound center patients are transplant patients or, you know, that's astounding. And that's not including the very large percentage that are on uh, immunosuppressive or immunomodulating agents for their rheumatoid arthritis or their other autoimmune disease. So these are not normal hosts. I don't know if you have any different guidance for interpreting some of these bacteria in light of the compromised host. So if you would like to give me some advice on that, um, feel free <laughs> to tell me whether, I assume it matters, but maybe it doesn't oh. No, I think you're 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 right on with obviously when the, the host has is dealing with other comorbidities that impair their ability to heal, they also provide a grounds for the microbes to just flourish. Um, so it's you know they 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 have the disadvantage of not being able to have the host mechanisms to counter some of these, which I think it makes it all the more important why on those patient types that you have use our technology because again if the wound is not progressing and you've done everything you normally do. And it's still not moving, and, and then you take a sample, and you're like, oh, now I see why, because we have a high bacteria load of you know these three or four, maybe even eight different species on some of these cases. But um, I, I think what what you pointed out is that in some, a lot of these cases, especially on transplant, because they're immunocompromised, they are more susceptible to fungal infections. So we're going to probably see more fungal species in those patients, um, and we also see it on when we um, when as you know, basically where there's a census change where you have a sample at one point and you treat it, especially if you use topical antimicrobials and you really hammer the bacteria. And then all of a sudden you see the, the exudate increasing again. And you, if you retest, you see the community has shifted. And so yeah, yeah. And a lot of times when it, when it does shift, often you see those fungal species because you've been killing all the bacteria. Yeah, you so killed the bacteria. The In, yeah, no, that's a really good point. Uh, another case that comes to mind is a woman is really pretty healthy. 65 year old didn't have any major um, comorbid diseases. She'd had a, a basal cell removed from her leg. Um, and it's always the anterior shin, which is not a very forgiving area. And then that area dehissed and started to enlarge. 
And, you know, the first thing you should think of is, is arterial insufficiency, but she had completely normal arterial supply. And I guess this does raise a point that I'm always emphasizing. <laughs> it's almost embarrassing to say it out loud, but we get so used to people having non-healing wounds <laughs> that, that we have to remember wounds don't not heal for no reason. That may be bad Texas grammar, but we ought to be able to say why every patient is in our waiting room. Yeah. And um, then we should be mitigating that. And it's usually more than one problem, but it 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 shouldn't be a mystery. <laughs> we yeah. shouldn't be seeing people where we just throw our hands up. I have no idea why they have this thing because it just means you haven't figured it out. But anyway, this woman had a kind of an ugly looking problem and I knew her arterial supply was fine because I tested it. And so I finally get the DNA assay and, and she has, um, is the report I get says a low bacterial load and it's got a NGS is what you call it. I guess when it's, you know, not significant, but E. coli and a couple of coronibacterium species. And, um, you know, it might be tempting to look at that and go, oh, well, you know, it's E. coli, but her bacterial load was low, no fungus. And species that are, you know, not unknown to sort of hang around. Bottom line with her is she had pyoderma gangrenosum and I just hadn't diagnosed it. It took me a while to realize I totally missed the diagnosis. So in some ways, even though, yeah, there were a few bacteria hanging around, um, there was no way that I could attribute the low bacterial load of some kind of uninteresting things, especially like corny bacterium, and say, well, clearly that's, she just needs antibiotics. So I just want to make sure people understand that um, all wounds are colonized with something. Like it's very unlikely that you'll do a sample. If you get a sample and get nothing, you probably did a bad sample. <laughs> There's going to be something there. So part of the thing is like, how are we talking low, medium, high levels? What uh, how bad are the bugs? How how sick is the patient? And those are things that I don't want to pretend that I'm an expert at. I um, am family practice trained, and maybe when you're family practice, you have to get comfortable with the idea that you may not know everything, but you should know enough to know when something's not right. <laughs> I don't always have to have the answers. I just have to sort of gut my way into, well, that's a problem, or that's not a problem. Maybe you could comment on some of those thoughts so we don't leave anybody with a misconception there. Yeah, I think it's important. One of the first things we ask physicians to look at on our report is the bacteria load. We do what's called a 16S count, which is basically a way of measuring the amount of bacterial cells in the sample. So that's kind of the first flag what you want to look at is if, if you see a low load, okay, well then maybe all of the debridements and biocides you're using um, are, are working really well. And if you see like a coronial bacterium, which is a normal species you find on the skin, you think, okay, it's not a big deal. Um, the, the NGS you see on the report is next-gen sequencing. So we'll okay. do, we do two levels. We do an initial PCR, where we're looking at more of the common species like Staph aureus or Pseudomonas. And then we're reflexing it to a second step, which is the next-gen sequencing, where we're matching the DNA in the sample to a, a huge database of over 57,000 bacteria and fungus. So when you said you see fungus that you haven't heard of, yeah, that's not, not, not surprising because we have 17,000 fungal species that we have in our database. So, uh, and, and in wound samples alone, we've you know found more than a thousand different fungal species. So, but uh, I think it's a good point that you wanna look at the bacteria load and if it's, if it's high, that should alert you to maybe we have a problem here, especially if the wound's not progressing. Yeah. Um, but if it's a low bacteria load and, and you see the wound is progressing, well, then, as you said, all wounds are colonized. We're going to find something, like you said, if you do a good sample. And then you have to make the determination, who's winning? Are you winning with the host or is the bacteria winning? And yeah, this and in her case, I think the critical thing is she was getting worse and there was nothing in your report that should have caused that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think what that told me is I was missing a diagnosis and that's when I stepped back and go, wait a minute, I gotta totally have missed, what does that leave? 
And then, I, oh my goodness. And, you know, I feel like I run a pyoderma gang or know some clinic some days, but it's so, even though I, I feel like I'm the most alert person around to this disease, she was one of those people that it just had to knock me over the head with a two by four for me to say, oh, obviously that's, and then I put her on prednisone and she healed like magic. And even her dermatologist had not clued into the fact that her dehiscence had nothing to do with his surgery, with her cancer, with any of those things that was come. And she had no diseases that should have contributed to it. It just comes out of the blue in some people. Um, but uh, I, it, so I guess the part of the take home message is that while many times the, the assay can tell me the thing that I've been missing. It could also tell me I need to look somewhere else. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. You know, we have you know orthopedic surgeons that use us, and they also they'll call me and say, "Rick, I'll I'll call them and we'll have a conversation." I'll, and I'll say, "Sorry, we didn't find anything." And they're like, "Oh my, thank God! I was hoping you were going to say that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know that's a, such a good point because there have been times like I'm also a, a vitamin Nazi because I've discovered so many of these patients are vitamin D deficient, and the money and the antibiotics and the effort that we expend and you know cellular products and all this stuff and for ten dollars we could have helped fix their inability to make collagen and we just didn't check it so. You know, I've seen that in, in orthopedic patients where they dehiss a joint replacement and everybody's tearing their hair out because of all the implications. And uh, one case I remember so well was a very sweet woman, not an old woman. She had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And it was the vitamin D thing. I just want to mention it's a serendipitous because I'm the editor, of, clinical editor of today's wound clinic. And I was checking standing in the hallway, sort of running through the um, next issue to make sure everything was ready to go to press. And the article I was reading, I'm embarrassed. I can't tell you who wrote it now because it was so good, but it was about vitamin D deficiency in the clinic. And then I walk into her room and she's dehissed a joint replacement for the second time. And um, she's only about 45 years old. She's been sick her whole life. And I'm standing there and her mother, she still is with her mother because she's been sick her whole life. And everybody's so worried about this uh, fact that she might need yet a third knee replacement because she can't, and she's got negative pressure and the sponge just falls out. There's no granulation tissue at all. And as I'm standing there, I'm thinking, you know, I am fair skinned. She looks like a fish, you know, <laughs> like when, she's so pasty white and I said, when was the last time you were ever, and you know, this is Houston, when was the last time you were outside? And she said, outside? Like outside, outside? Yeah, you know, like outside. And she said, oh, two years. You know, I just got out of the car. And sure enough, her vitamin D level was just undetectable. And we put her on vitamin D and she completely healed. So, you know, I just want to point out that sometimes it's the bacteria and sometimes we just haven't done our job. Yep. And uh, so the, the results can help us either way. So you might just hint those orthopedic surgeons to put the people on some vitamins and give them some L-arginine and see if, see if that helps. So that's my including, thought for the day. <laughs> the other, you know, those, there been, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, yeah, you're right on uh, improving the host factors is equally as important to, to the whole healing process. So, yeah. And, and obviously with, um, Vitamin deficiency of D, uh, vitamin D, and yeah, that's going to make a huge difference. And and then they'll be colonized with something, but it may not matter. So you know, there's so many times though that that I've gotten high bacterial loads. You know, like I just pulled up the report of the diabetic foot ulcer, and I'm afraid I may not even be able to pronounce all of these. But um, you know, the bacterial load is high, and it's Dentatrophomonas providentia, Proteus, E. coli. And one that I can't pronounce the first word of, but the second word is fecalis. And, you know, as a family practice doc, I'm always those ones that sound like poop are probably not things that ought to be in your on your foot ulcer uh, with, you know, varying percentages. And so I guess my question to you is when you see and I've seen as many as 15. I don't know what your record number of different bacteria is. 
And I don't know. 24. What, how many? I think 24 is most oh my I've God. seen on so, you know, one of the questions I end up having for you is, yeah, that sounds like a wound that I need to, and the, by the way, the, the wound itself, beautiful granulation tissue, just not getting smaller, does not look infected. Um, not really all that much drainage, lovely pink granulation tissue. So I think that's the other thing that can surprise us is that um, it may not always be, uh, the wound may not always look like you'd expect it to look with a high bacterial load. But I guess my point is, if I get 15 things, well, you know, one of the infectious disease docs kind of like, well, there's so many different things. It's probably, they're probably not important. You know, it's almost like <laughs> oh, well, when you get that many, it's some kind of, I don't know, contamination or something. But, uh, like I say, I'm a simple girl. I look at that and go, I don't think that sounds right. Uh, that sounds bad to me. <laughs> can, can you give me a simple girl uh, approach to yeah. five or 10 of these? <laughs> I, I, I think there's there's two approaches. I mean, first of all, we have on our normal skin, we have a microbiome. So they have a they have a positive role to play on our skin. But once, as Dr. Randy Walcott taught me, once the skin is ruptured and microbes move into tissue, they're not doing good things. So if you have multiple species in there, Randy's view was kill them all. Now we can't kill them all with systemic antibiotics because obviously you don't want to put them on three, four antibiotics uh, because you're going to wipe out their gut microbiome and cause right, C. Right. and all kinds of other issues. And that's the advantage of using topicals. But if you don't want to use topicals, because I have some doctors that say, no, I don't believe in topicals. Well, first of all, you should really look at the literature because the topical literature from years ago was all based on culture directed. So if the cultures didn't find anaerobes and you didn't put anything for anaerobes, then you probably didn't get a good outcome. But yeah. when you use DP evidence to pick your topicals, it really makes a difference. But if you don't want to use topicals, Randy also showed molecular techniques will allow you to pick the better antibiotic, systemic antibiotic. For example, if we find the wound is a lot of anaerobes and you picked a, a cephalosporin that doesn't cover anaerobes versus augmentin, you're probably going to get a better outcome by picking the antibiotic that's going to give you a broader coverage. So we teach physicians to look at this, this if we have 15 on there and you see, wow, I could kill, you know, half of them, <laughs> half of them with one antibiotic. Well, there you go, uh, especially if it's the dominant one, because that's the advantage we give you the percentages. Yeah. So if you really want to target the the, the higher the, uh, you know, the ones that have the most of the community, uh, they're 40 percent or 50 percent of the community, then there you go. That's because obviously if, if you kill the dominant one within the community, the biofilm, the host is still everything else you're doing and the host is doing to try to eradicate the rest of the community. You're going to really weaken that that community of bacteria. So, so talk to be, me about the thing. resistance genes. So the one I was just telling you about, you use the report says there's two resistance genes, macrolide and aminoglycoside. And um, in fact, it says macrolide erm B. I don't know what that is. And aminoglycoside ALF3. So but at the end of this um, podcast, everybody's going to know exactly how not smart I am. But <laughs> I'll go ahead and ask you publicly, what does that mean? And does yep. that, it, that that's definitely referring to the specific bacteria that you found? Correct. Those within the community. So if you took a scraping or a swab of the wound and we captured all the DNA from the species living there in that community, then we, they, we also find out if that community has the resistant genes. The reason why antibiotics don't work is because the bacteria or fungus acquire resistance genes that basically deactivate. So if you have, a, as your patient, you have aminoglycoside resistance, that means the sample had aminoglycoside resistance, and that would tell you that, okay, I don't want to use aminoglycoside. And I see this a lot in wound samples because what happens is in a lot of wound care centers, as you know, you open the drawer in the clinic room, and what do you see in there? A tube of gent ointment. Right, so they, I was they're using just about to talk about that. So yeah, keep going. Yeah. yeah, so if you start using genomycin and maybe a subtherapeutic dosing on a wound, you're going to get the the bacteria is going to get smart, and they're going to basically acquire resistance to it, and so you're basically taking that antibiotic off the table as an option. So we teach physicians look at those resistant genes, and if you're if you're the pharmacist and you're going to make a topical, well, then don't put those antibiotics into the topical. If you're prescribing a 
oral antibiotic or IV, you want to avoid those classes that we pick. In this case, you know, macrolide is not a big deal because you're not going to use azithromycin or clarithromycin on in wounds for the most part. You're going to be using, you know, but aminoglycoside, that could be a problem because yeah, if you're yeah. using any IV amicacin or tobramycin or something that pretty much would not be a good choice. So you raised something really interesting, uh, and I don't have a dog in this fight, but, you know, I run a wound registry, and I think one of the dirty secrets of all of wound care is the use of topical antibiotics of all different kinds. And and I, I'm not saying whether that's good. I'm not saying whether that's bad. It's just that we don't tend to talk very much about it. And it, it is common. And there is a good argument for doing that. But people are, genomycin, you know, just the typical pharmacy available genomycin, because that's covered by their pharmacy plan, is a very commonly utilized. There's bacitracin too. I see that a lot. And I don't know, as I say, I don't have a dog in this fight, except we're not talking about the fact that there are lots of clinics that their standard thing is either ginger bacitracin or something like that. It, it, should we be doing uh, DNA um, evaluations, assays, before we use topical antibiotics? It kind of calls a, a, that into question as a routine. Yeah, I, was, I think it's a great point. If if your if your standard practice of one of the agents you use is a gentamicin or any any of these topicals you're using them in an empiric approach, then um, yeah, you probably would like to have know whether my patient already has resistance to that to that class of antimicrobials, and so that would it would definitely help you in the saying that okay, hey, we did a, a test on your wound and. You have aminoglycoside resistance, so we're we're not going to be using the gent ointment on on your wound because it's obviously, if anything, it's going to just help the bacteria acquire more resistance and not going to do anything. It, so, it feels like we ought to talk a little it's bit interesting more to, to publicly use about that because <laughs> that's a really common practice, even though people don't necessarily. Yeah, it. yeah, and um, but it, it, another thing that we don't, I mean, we haven't addressed here is that all the many patients that I've, and I don't do uh, an assay on everybody. I tend to, you know, in patients, maybe all the immunocompromised people, if I can do it, I'm going to, if everything isn't going well, because I feel like I really need to make sure that I know what's going on, <laughs> because their life could certainly be at stake. But if it's the rest of the patients, which could be 85% of them, then I'm picking and choosing uh, when I feel like I've hit a wall. And um, sometimes I get support from infectious disease and sometimes they criticize me. I don't really take any of that to heart, but I think people need to be prepared for the fact that you may have an infectious disease doc who gets it and who's open-minded, or there may be somebody who's very dismissive. And um, so that's why I try to take all viewpoints, but I'm still the one responsible. So I'll, the fact that somebody has a bias against something may or may not have to sway me. Although with the immunocompromised people, gosh, I'm almost never going to make a choice, especially with the transplant team that is going right. to be in a vacuum. You know, I'm going to make sure somebody makes the final call. But having said that, the frustration that I have is that I can't get this in everybody for insurance reasons. And so I don't know, that wasn't really one of the things that we thought we would talk about, but I think people probably want to know where that stands and and what they should do because it how, doesn't make any difference how fabulous something is if you can't get it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for bringing it up because that's, I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I was glad to have, have you on uh, and be able to speak with you tonight because we need all the help we can get. I mean, we went to the AMA and CMS and we got our own unique PLA code that Medicare, if they have traditional Medicare, Medicare, we can file a claim and Medicare will pay us $350, which if you think about it, sounds like a lot, but if you do an aerobic culture at $70 an anaerobic culture, it's another $170 and the fungal is another four to $500. So our and test you might is not get any cheaper than traditional it, culture might be a long time from now. I think that's another thing to point out with fungus is that it doesn't make any difference what you do. 
that's traditional, the likelihood of yield is low and long, long from now. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. One well, of the. <laughs> well, it's important. I mean, think the 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 problem we have, and patients get frustrated because they have Medicare, but they went with the Humana plan or the mm -hmm. Cigna Medicare Advantage plan, and they're simply not paying, and so it's wrong what they're doing. And I I, I need to get more advocates to you know raise the alarm with you know the government to say you know what if you're selling a medicare plan you should follow the medicare policies and if yeah. medicare covers this test then why aren't you not covering this test we have um you know we we're, we're really fighting against the commercial insurance companies now some of them do pay for it. i mean blue cross and blue shield of texas they do reimburse our test um so we have do have commercial plans united for the most part, unless you have a really low level crappy plan, United will pay us. But there are so many of them that just, you know, want to call it, quote, experimental investigational and then not pay it. So what we do is we discount it to two forty nine. dollars For years, I had it at one ninety nine, dollars but I just in the last year have gotten killed by the cost of lab supplies and mm -hmm. shipping and everything else. So we had to raise it to two forty nine. dollars So and we tell patients, you know, if you want to do a payment plan, we're happy to do that with you too, but we're trying to get patients to fight back with their insurance companies to say, this is just not right. Uh, especially women with chronic urinary tract infections, you know, they'll go to their doctor, they'll get a culture, they'll get an antibiotic, they'll pay for the office visit, they'll pay for the culture, they'll pay for the antibiotic, and they come back and they're still symptomatic. And, you know, they keep doing the same thing over again, expecting a different result. So um, we have actually now 30,000 women that have signed a petition demanding the AUA you know, support our test to be used when cultures have failed. So do a culture first, but if it doesn't work, you know, allow the provider to to order our test to really see what's causing the infection. And so we're we're doing as much as we can to try to get the, the payers, but I tell doctors all the time, I'm in this fight, but I need your help. I need physicians to stand up and say, this is wrong. Uh, and there, I know the insurance companies are treating physicians badly too. They're treating hospitals badly. I, um, I know that Humana is in some places, doctor groups are not even taking some of these. Yeah, we get into companies. this just role denying. of kind of learned helplessness. And I know the feeling is even with, with whether it's skin subs or hyperbarics, it almost doesn't matter. You know, you see Medicare Advantage and think, well, never mind. It's not even, you know, it's I just don't have time for another one of these fights trying to go to the mattresses right. over this thing. And I have to decide how I want to use my time. It makes me feel that we ought to have more patients involved. A lot of our patients are frail and, and voiceless, but boy, um, you know, 85 is the new 75 and 75 is the new 65. We, I see a lot of patients that are retired captains of industry. And I think we ought to turn those folks loose to yeah, I, help us make the case because doctors are so beleaguered and their time is so limited that, you know, if you're going to ask me, what am I going to spend my time arguing about? Maybe in a transplant patient, it would be this, but honestly, maybe not. But for for wound centers, one of the interesting things is once it got out that I could do these and that I would do them, I have orthopedic surgeons who would send me patients just because they're worried and they want the test. So, you know, yeah. whatever is like, you know, I'm happy to have your thoughts on the wound, Caroline, but really, would you get the thing? Um, because I can't get it at my institution and now I'm really worried. So it's funny how it can end up actually being a, a reason for referral. And of course, I'm glad to see these people and help as I can. But that's a shout out to some of the, the wound care practices that, uh, boy, if you get a few believers out there, you know, and when you got the Texas Medical Center medical schools, and they're calling me saying, oh, my gosh, so-and-so sick again. Remember that lady who had rhizopus? Can you help us? It's like, it is a sad day when the medical school has to call me to ask yeah. me to get a test when they're the finest in the land. Like, that, that's, they should be embarrassed. I'm glad to do it. But it is embarrassing. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I mean, we're, we are making inroads. We've done so much on orthopedic uh, because, of obviously, the huge cost of in infected implants we focused a lot of research on our on our orthopedics, and that has paid off in the sense that more and more hospitals are contracting with us. We just got a contract with UCLA last week, um, so some of the bigger institutions, Tufts in Boston, uh, you know, we are getting more of those contracts. So I think you know the insurance companies are going to lose out when they see that this is being accepted and adopted by major medical institutions and hospital systems. So. 
but it's and a you know you say end, end up saving people a uh, joint yeah. replacement that they you know they were going to end up with another joint replacement that they may not have needed so there's just a lot of ways that we can impact yeah. people positively so i i, I do um I was I'm a little embarrassed to do the podcast since I feel like I'm always in the in the position of a learner who maybe doesn't know more than anybody else out there and probably a lot less than most. But if folks are cautious because they aren't sure they'll be able to interpret the test, you help. And if folks are worried that that they won't know what to do next. Um, you know, you, I just thank you again for providing resources of people we can talk to who can help guide our thoughts on that. So it's not just that I get this paper with names of bacteria I can't pronounce and I'm left to to try to figure it out. <laughs> Although I will say sometimes having the patients not panic is part of it, you know, I'll prep them and say, now look, there's a lot of names on here and they're confusing. And I don't really, like you can go home and Google all of them if you want, but you know, here's the big picture is that your bacterial count was, you know, the load was low. And, you know, most of these are not, are not killer bugs, but uh, I, there, sometimes the PR ends up having to be to calm the patient down um, because they're going to spend all night on Google trying to figure what these things are. And maybe that's not a good idea for them. <laughs> oh, yeah. We've been, we've done a lot on patient education. I think it's important as, as just as that the patients have a, you know, aren't, aren't afraid and, and don't go you know, get over carried away with what they, the report is showing them. So yeah, have if there's done, a patient education material that I should have, then, then, then tell me what it is or send us, provide a link, because it would be really nice to have more patient educational materials for the folks that want them. I think that would be very useful. Uh, so I'd yeah. appreciate having more resources like that. Yeah, we will. There's a QR, a little pad with a QR code on it that while they're sitting in the waiting room in the in the clinic room waiting for you to come in they can take their phone and scan it it'll take them to a nice animation video that explains the whole thing to them oh that's and, really cool I haven't seen that so thanks for educating me on that well I really appreciate Rick what you're doing I don't know that I um, provided any useful information for oh, the folks who yeah. are listening but it's a real honor to talk to you and 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 there's one other shout out. This you're probably not going to appreciate this. You can cut it out later. But you know there've been a few unique cases where I begged you for a free kit <laughs> for a good cause, and you did it. And I don't want to take advantage of that. But you know there are times that your back's against the wall. You, you know you really are desperate to help someone. There's no possible way they can afford it. And so I appreciate the fact that you're willing to to do that as long as we don't take advantage of you and, and take it lightly. You, you really have uh, helped a lot of people um, that I was worried about, so. Oh, yeah. you should never feel like, don't be ever afraid to ask. I'll always do those, I'll always do those. And me, it's really, this is really about, you know, helping patients and, you know, it's, it's it, people say, you know, it's always about money, but it really is not about money. I mean, I get, I'm more motivated by hearing the success stories and the helping people, so. Well, yeah. and also if somebody is afraid to try it and they feel overwhelmed by all their contracting thing and they're worried about somebody, it is a way to tip your toe into things yeah. To, yeah. to just say, could I have a kit? And, you know, here's a really good cause. And then if it's useful, then maybe we can figure it out. I think it does create um, converts um, once yeah. you are looking at a patient and looking at a result and then kind of processing the information to understand what the the next steps would be so anyway thank you for your your commitment to patient care and the way that you support clinicians i really really appreciate all that about you so much thank you that's it was a kind words and i uh, appreciate all your time doing this it's it's a it's a huge help it was very very valuable and uh we're gonna we're gonna take advantage of it and uh and have you help us get you know yeah you know, get the word out to get more help, more patients have access to this technology. Yeah, let's get the patients, let's stick the patients on their congressman if that's what we have to do. Yeah. That might be yep. the best path at this point since you've made the science argument. Maybe yeah. now it's time to pull out the stops. So really appreciate you talking to me, guys. Thank you so much. Yep, I look forward to coming to Houston and seeing you again. Okay. Doors are open. Good Thank you.
And happy holidays. Thank you too. Thank you for tuning in to Microgen DX Mic'd Up. We hope that you found our broadcast informative and helpful. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about our services, please visit our website at microgendx.com. Power up your precision with Microgen DX testing, the key to accurate diagnostics and personalized treatments. Until next time, this is Microgen DX Mic'd Up signing off.